Got it. Okay. Okay. We good? Good morning. So good to have everybody with us this morning. Beautiful, crisp morning, beautiful day. God's work, our hands, Sunday, all across the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America today. And it's a special celebration of our service to the Lord. We open with prayer. God of mercy and compassion. Be with us this day as we hear of the healing love of Jesus. Remind us that we are also recipients of his compassion, and we are called to bring the same hope and love to others. Prepare us for service in his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please stand for the opening hymn. Glory to God, His goodness shines on me, and to the sun, His grace. Spirit. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. He said, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his finger into his ears. Then he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epaphatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have you here and great to have all of you online here as well. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the risen Christ. Amen. You know, in ancient Greece, it was customary for peddlers who walked the streets with their wares to cry out, What do you lack? What do you lack? They'd go up and down the streets. What do you lack? Kind of like a ice cream truck today. You ring the bell, the kids come running out of the houses. Well, it was the same kind of thing. What do you lack? And the people would hear, oh, the merchants are here, the peddlers are here, and they'd run out, and if they needed anything or if they wanted anything, they'd look to see what the merchants were selling that particular day. What do you lack? Let me ask you this morning, what do you lack? What do I lack? What do we lack? Take an honest inventory of yourself, ourselves. Have, have we found contentment? Are we close enough to God to receive his guidance and strength? Do you understand and experience that peace that passes all understanding that Paul talks about in his letter to the Christians in Philippi? Deciding what we lack is kind of the... The, the first step, right, in securing it. But know this, Christ fulfills our needs, can fulfill our needs, needs that are to some extent physical, certainly, but even more so the deepest needs of heart, mind, and soul. So what is it? What do we lack? Our gospel lesson for this morning from Mark's seventh chapter focuses on two people who lacked something, who needed something, now, before we get to those folks, let's check out, I want to check out the background a bit to our text. You know, throughout chapter 6, we did the Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. We did that for five weeks. All that took place around the Sea of Galilee, because he had fed the 5,000 and went across the Sea of Galilee. And now, in our text for today, it's kind of curious because it says this. Now, Jesus got up from there, namely the Sea of Galilee, and went from there to the region of Tyre, and when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know about it, and yet he could not escape notice. Okay? So Jesus gets up from the Sea of Galilee, he goes up to Tyre. Tyre is about 35 miles northwest of the Sea of Galilee, and Tyre is a port city right on the Mediterranean Sea, on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So, remember, 35 miles, it's not getting in your car and going to Springfield. No, he walked, right, the 35 miles with the disciples. That's just how they got around. And we can imagine that there were people meeting and greeting him along the way and asking things from the way. By the time he gets to Tyre, he wants to do what? He wants to relax. 
They, he, wants some, he needs some R&R &R along with the disciples. By the way, for years I thought that was really, what does Jesus need rest for? I mean, look who he is, right? But no, Jesus was fully human too. He needed rest. He's looking, he's looking to go to a place where nobody knows where he is so he can take a deep breath. So he goes to Tyre to do that. But that's not the end of the geographical story here because if we, if we just bump ahead to halfway through our gospel lesson, it says in verse 31, again then, after meeting the woman, whom we'll talk about here in a moment, again he left the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of the Decapolis. So now he's back to the Sea of Galilee. The only thing is the Decapolis is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So he's gone northwest, North, east, south, and now he's back at the bottom southern portion of the Sea of Galilee, which means, scholar te scholars tell us, he walked over 80 miles. Over 80 miles. Now, think, it, it wasn't like a straight line, and everywhere he go went, there was a crowd. That's why he says, by the way, on occasion, after he heals somebody, don't tell anybody about it. We, we think to ourselves, well, why wouldn't he want everybody? Because everybody would come out to him in the countryside and he couldn't get into the cities. He couldn't move. It's like he said, you all stay where you are. I will be there. But they all came out flocking to him. Some scholars say that this gospel lesson took eight months to happen. By the time Jesus left the Sea of Galilee initially, went to Tyre, did all that traveling around, walking around, his vacation, vacation, was eight months. Now, now think about all the people he healed, all the people he ministered to during that eight-month period of time, over those 80-plus miles, and Mark shares with us two of the miracles. Out of all those hundreds of people Jesus healed, two. Why these two? What did Mark think was so important about these two that it was necessary for us 2,000 years later to know something about them? Well, let's take a look at the first. Verse 25. Okay, he wants to escape. You know, he's in the house. Blinds are, are shut. He just wants to take a nap, right? But after hearing about him... A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Came pounding at the door and found him and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician descent, which makes sense because Tyre was in Phoenicia. Right? And she repeatedly asked him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now our translation this morning mistakenly leaves out repeatedly. It just says she came to ask. So the impression you get from our gospel lesson that's printed in our bulletin for today is that she showed up and Jesus said, let's have a conversation. But that's not really what happened. She had to repeatedly ask Jesus. Followed him around the house, around the yard, around the backyard. Disciples are saying, well, you just leave him alone, go away. And she wouldn't do it. She was persistent. Now we might say, well, Jesus was rude, he was, must have had a bad day, he was still really ticked off that he couldn't get his vacation in because somebody was calling him all the time, whatever. But that's not really the case. We need to know one thing, well, a couple things. First is this, it was unlawful for a Jewish man to speak to any woman in public. Unlawful. Don't do it go back to jail or whatever that shoots and ladders game is or whatever. You're not allowed to speak to a woman. Now, he has broken that law before. In John chapter 4, he's got the Samaritan woman at the well. He's talking to her. That was a no-no too. Okay, but there's, that's one thing that's part of this. The other thing is we need to understand the conversation, which I think is, is pretty fascinating. He finally said to the woman, let the children be satisfied first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, by children, he's re referring to the people of Israel. He's saying that the gospel comes first to the people of Israel. Gentiles will be later. She doesn't know that. But Israel is first. The other word that's interesting here is the word dogs. 
That's what Jewish people called Gentiles. Gentiles, again, were a- anybody that was not Jewish was a Gentile. And the Jews called Gentiles dogs. Dogs as in feral, wild, dangerous, savage dogs that would wander around the town and eat out of the garbage cans and in the alleys. They were flea-bitten. They were probably diseased, skinny, see their ribs. You get the picture. That's what the kind of dog that the Jews called us. And as we read this in the English, we think, well, that's, he's calling her a dog. But the word for dog that Jesus uses is domesticated puppy. It's the word for domesticated puppy. Here's another thing we need to know. Jews in Jesus' day did not have pets in the house. They did not domesticate dogs. Dogs were those, kind of like my mother. My mother was a farm girl who grew up in Xenia, Ohio. And when I wanted to get a pet when I was a kid, I wanted to get a dog, she'd say, there's no dog, I'm not letting one dog into my house. Dogs are for the outside, they're for the farm. Where she grew up, they didn't let the dogs in the house. If the dogs, if it was raining, the dog, there's the barn, right? There's the barn. She didn't put the dog on her lap and pet the little puppy. She didn't do that. Dogs are for outside. They're dirty, they're blah, blah, but they do have a job, but they're for the outside, right? So when I was in the third grade, guess what I came home with? A cat in a box. Kelly Newman gave me that cat in the third grade when we were in the third grade. And I bring it home, and Mom said, oh, I wasn't specific enough. Cats aren't allowed either. They're even worse than dogs. On the farm, we did what with our cats? They stayed in the barn to get rid of all the rodents. That was their job. And I'm convinced that Fluffy, my cat, that's the name I gave him on the way home, Fluffy knew Mom was thinking of that because day two of Fluffy being with us on a trial basis, he got a mouse in the house and brought it and put it at my mother's feet. (laughs) He knew exactly the one he had to convince. And mom said, all right, well, he's got some use. Okay, he can stay. That's kind of how the Jews viewed pets, dogs, and that sort of thing. Gentiles, on the other hand, commonly domesticated their dogs, commonly had dogs as pets. So when Jesus is in this conversation, he's referring to Gentiles not as feral dogs, but as puppies, as as important pieces to the family. And when she says, even, even the puppies under the table feed on the children's crumbs, he said, you get it. You get it. And the demon's gone, long distance. A long distance, example of long distance healing. Okay, so that's, that's the woman. What we can learn is this. The woman was desperate, right? She was desperate. She was persistent. And what we can learn from this is that God in Christ Jesus meets our own desperations with hope, healing, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Jew and Gentile alike. Jew and Gentile alike. By the way, what's one of the fastest growing countries, fastest growing population of Christians in that country? Guess what country it is? I think I said this a few weeks ago. It's Iran. Iran has one of the fastest populations of Christians, fastest growing populations of Christians. Muslims are coming to Christ over and over and over and over again in Iran. Desperation. God is there for all of us, Gentile, Jew, everybody. Okay, so that's, that's the first person. That's the first thing we need to re- remember. Okay, so then again, he left the region of Tyre, came through Sidon, Sea of Galilee, within the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him one who was deaf, had difficulty speaking, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself, put his fingers in his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, Jesus said to him, Epapatha, that is, be opened. 
and his ears were open, the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And all of them were utterly astonished. He has done all things well. He makes even those who are deaf hear and those who are able to talk speak. Now, this is kind of, kind of a different method of healing somebody, right? He takes the man away from everybody else, and then he performs what is actually a, a, a Jewish ritual of cleansing. It was a ritual. By the way, and I bet you didn't know this from confirmation, in 1523, Martin Luther wrote his first edition of the baptismal liturgy. And the baptismal liturgy included the pastor to take pastor's index finger, wipe the saliva off his tongue, and put that saliva on the mouth of the infant and the ear of the infant, and then say, be open. Be open to a life of ministry, right? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now be open to a life of ministry. God's hands, God's work, our hands today. What do you think will happen? Yeah, we've got a baptism coming up October 6th. I wonder if I try that. You think? Probably shouldn't. Dr. Joe, you wouldn't recommend that. Or you just recommend me not doing it. Probably, that's probably what you're talking about. Okay. So here he, he, he does this. Let me say this. None of us are really great at listening, and none of us are really great at hearing. I mean, there's a deafness in all of us at a certain level. I mean, I've come to believe, I've come to believe that the lack of hearing, the lack of, it, of listening, is the foundation of a great many of our issues. You know, the political divide. We're not good at listening to each other. We're not good at hearing after we listen. You know, we're not good at that. Cultural divide, same, same thing. We don't hear and we don't listen very well. Breakup of our families. Couples will come in for, for marital counseling and, and it takes about two and a half seconds to realize that somebody's not listening and somebody's not hearing and 99.9% chance it's both of them aren't hearing or listening. Wars even, you know, this whole bit again in the Middle East, you know, are we, are we gonna have a treaty? Well, you gotta sit down and talk before you do that, and once you get there, you gotta hear and gotta listen. We don't know how to do that well. We're all deaf at some sort of level. Why? Because we hear what we wanna hear or we hear what we wish to hear in whatever way. And it's the same thing spiritually in our relationship with the Lord. You know, we, we hear sometimes what we want to hear. You know, I, you know, I don't know that I, I want to hear a lot of the things the Lord tells me in God's word because it's a challenge to me, right? Give me the low-hanging fruit, God. <laughs> you know, the easy stuff? The other stuff just kind of makes me nervous, scares me a little bit. Yeah. Hearing's tough, even our relationship with the Lord. So this morning we have two people. One is desperate. You know, the things that worry us in this life, the things that give us anxiety, set us off, that vex us, that leads to despair. Jesus overcomes. Jesus overcomes real simple. Second part, deafness. Be open. Be open to hearing above the din of desperation. To hearing above the din of desperation, the love of God in Christ Jesus. I'd like to do a little, a little uh, uh, listening exercise. And I, actually we did this in worship in a sermon context about 10 years ago, so some of you might remember it. But I invite you just to relax, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just listen. Listen and hear God's words to you today and every day. You ready? Hear the voice of God say, I love you. I am listening.
kiss me. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. I love you for you are my precious son, my precious daughter. I love you and bless both you and your family. I love you. Everything is going to be okay because you belong to me. I love you. Your loved ones are fine. You will see them again. Don't ever forget, I rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And because you are mine, you will too. I love you. I, I can't say this often enough. Your sins are forgiven. I love you, and my love in your life will make you a better husband, a better wife, a better child, a better daughter, a better son, a better parent, a better grandparent, a better worker, a better friend, a better leader. I love you, and my love in your life will give you more patience and compassion. I love you and I'm with you every moment of every day. You are not alone. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. Because your sins are forgiven, now you can forgive yourself. Let go of that guilt. It's weighing down your life. I love you. I know your faults and your shortcomings, and I love you in spite of them. I love you, and there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. I love you, and I feel the pain you're in. My love will get you through that pain. I love you, and I'm with your children. Wherever they go, I go. I love you. I can help turn your sadness into joy, joy in me. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. And because your sins are forgiven, now you can forgive those who have hurt you. Let go of that anger. It's building a wall between us. I love you and I have great plans for you. Don't give up. We're not through yet. I love you. You can trust me. I will carry all your burdens if you'll just lay them down and give them to me. I love you and I'm in the midst of your suffering. It is me who is holding you up. It's me who is holding you together. Don't let go. Hang on to me. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. Be open and welcome home. Amen. We stand and sing together, healer of our every ill.
please be seated. And I invite our young people to come forward. I'm going to need some help today as we do our God's work, our hands blessing. So everybody come on up. Um, I'm actually going to have you all come up here. Okay. You can sit on the step there. You can sit over here. Okay. Come on up. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Come on up. Come on. Come on up. Okay. So I'm going to do a special reading and then ask the congregation to respond. And I need you guys to hold up the signs so they know what to say. Okay? So, I need at least three of you to help, okay? Who wants to do God is at work? Right here, I have, and this works, because I have multiple of them, okay? Anybody else for God is at work? Okay, I need God is praised. Who wants to hold this sign? Right here, okay, and you want one too? Let's see, I have another, I have another God is at work. Got that one, okay. And I have a God at work and amen. Who else wants to help? You want one? There you go. You wanna help? Will you two help together? Okay? Or you two help together? Is that good? Since you're beside each other, okay? So I will point to you when it's your turn to raise your sign and you see that we have multiple god is at work so when i we can all raise our sign at the same time okay now so this is our celebration of vocation and blessing our hands for ministry which is part of our elca god's work our hands day uh celebration so you all ready Ready? Okay. We are called to proclaim the good news. God at work. God at work. God is at work. The good news is not left in some history long ago or place far away. God is at work. God is at work. Very good. In the world still today, in us and through us, God is glorified in our work. When we offer a helping hand, God is praised. God is praised. You raise that up. God is praised. Perfect. When we share our abundance, God is known in the world. God is at work. Hold it up. God is at work. Wonderful. So God is at work in us. And in our service today and in our daily lives, let us live out what God has called us to in baptism. God is at work. God is at work through our hands. Okay, now before we get to the amen, we have a blessing to do. So everybody, your signs down. I want everybody to join in. Hold one of your hands out with the back of your hand facing you, okay? And as I say this next sentence, I want you to make a sign of the cross on your hand, okay? Now ready to do that? One, two, three, let's do that. God bless your hands. Um, God bless our hands and your work. Okay, now turn your hand over so you have your palm. Okay, and we're going to make another sign of the cross. Okay, you ready? So make the sign of the cross that through you, God's love may be known. And now we say, hold up your sign. There we go. Amen. Okay, wonderful. And now we have a special blessing for our piggy banks. So everybody, um, can you collect the signs for us? Thank you very much. And everybody come up to the table with me. And I want you to put your hand on a piggy bank or on the table. Okay, come on up, come on around. Okay. It's okay, it's okay. We're gonna bless what um, has come in. And if any of you have piggy banks, um, you may bring them up, leave them on the altar or the communion rail um, today or 
after worship, bring them to the table. You can also give online or use a pew envelope um, for our special Lutheran social services.